by now you've seen uh, Top Gun Maverick and you know all about how to fly fighter jets in combat so you're ready to go and uh, do, the, do the games and you're going to fly in welded wing and you're going to go great. Well, not so much. Stick with me on Flywire as we're going to explore that a little bit. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to talk about combat formations in fighters. If you saw my review of Top Gun Maverick, you know that I liked that movie. I thought it was fantastic, actually. Great story, great uh, flying footage. It was really amazing, especially the in-cockpit stuff. It was really, really cool. But, yeah, there's one thing that you got to remember here is, is that that movie was entertainment. By definition, the movie's entertainment. It's not reality. I guess reality is more of a documentary, but even some of those are kind of made up, too. <clears throat> but I'll be honest with you that, a, that trying to film a two-ship or a four-ship uh, flying tactical would be, or even BFM, ACM, um, would be kind of boring, I think, because um, <clears throat> the perspective of a camera is about like that and the perspective of your eye is about like that. And we're talking distances, you know, are huge. So little bitty airplanes, you don't see it doing anything. You definitely don't see any person in it. So that's kind of a problem. Um, Anyway, the Navy uses a, a two-ship as the basic formation, and, you know, they fly a semblance of uh, Air Force Tactical as well. And in the previous videos I did, Formation 101 and, one, and 201, uh, I talked about the genesis of formation, the administrative formations, and the evolution of, some of the evolution of combat formations. And the bottom line is that you need a team. You need at least two airplanes to fly, fight, and win in combat <coughs> and come back another day to do it again. Formation is pretty much the bread and butter of military fighters. It's just a reality. You gotta, it, there's at least two ship. I mean, you go everywhere like your twins. <clears throat> but, um, and, it, and it, it imbues everything that they do. Formation is just a subset, a skill level uh, that's entry. Everything else you have, you have to learn how to fly the airplane and fight the airplane, et cetera. Um, the formation is just part of that. It's just, just like breathing. Uh, so anyway, uh, th for those of us that don't fly fast jets anymore, um, we do it just for fun, and uh, that's challenging and fun as well, but uh, it's not the same thing. Fighters are by definition maneuverable, and modern jet fighters are fast, okay? Your formation has to respect, respect reflect, <laughs> which word am I going to use? Reflect the speed and G available. Okay, after all, you need to be able to max, max perform the airplane without hitting the other guy. And to be able to max perform the airplane, you have to be going fast enough to do that. Uh, so that's, you know, kind of a problem. Now turn rate and radius are problems or issues. Okay, so <clears throat> one thing we let's talk about is uh, uh, VA. All right, I got my whiteboard here. And uh, VA, it's design maneuvering speed, according to the FAA. And it's the fastest speed at a certain weight that an abrupt control movement or a gust load will not over G the airplane. Typically, the airplane is going to stall above VA uh, or uh, it's going to stall above VA, typically. That's what's going to happen. And that stall acts as a safety un that unloads the wing and then that acts as a safety uh, feature of the, of the airplane. So stall it instead of break it, okay? In the fighter world, uh, this, uh, there, there isn't really a design maneuver speed that equates to what it is in the civil, civilian world. In the fighter world, it's called maneuver speed, or generally everybody calls it corner velocity. And corner velocity is the lowest speed at which you can pull max G, okay? By definition, if uh, you're um, slower than corner velocity, well, you're not gonna be able to get to max G. You don't have enough energy in the airplane. And if you're faster, then uh, you stand a real chance of over G in the airplane. So corner velocity is the, is the speed. And uh, for swept wing airplanes, certain swept wing airplanes like the F-15 and the F-4, they had a very defined corner velocity that didn't vary by very much. But uh, other airplanes, uh, a little more modern design uh, than the F-4, and the F-15 was just after the F-4, um, they have a corner uh, velocity window that's typically 80-ish, 60, 80, maybe 100 knots in the F F-16s range that uh, wide. So they can get max G in that, in that uh, 
that regime, okay? But what that does is that affects their turn rate and their turn radius, okay? You gotta, the thing about uh, maximum G is learning how to do that, especially when you've got a very narrow uh, corner velocity number, uh, over G is a fact of life uh, to learn where the limits are, okay? And you have to know how to get max G or die. I mean, those are your choices, right? You gotta learn how to fly the frickin' airplane. And uh, in the F4, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have anything that uh, would tell on you if you over g the airplane. It was just a, a uh, <coughs> uh, honor system kind of thing. And most of the F4s I flew were bent because they'd been over G'd and over time uh, they get a little bent and they fly a little crooked. The F-15, on the other hand, had an overload warning system, an OWL system, and it had five different levels of uh, over G. And each one of them would come with its own version of what inspections needed to be done. So the bottom line is, is that we need to, what we're interested in really is is turn rate and radius. I mentioned those before. Both of these things are dependent on your speed and your G available. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, turn radius. And uh, turn radius, <coughs> got to use my glasses now. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to write this equation. I didn't say there would be no math. So the actual equation is v squared times a constant and the tangent of the bank angle. Okay, the things we int we're interested for is turn rate and turn radius. Both of these things are dependent on your speed and speed and your g available, as we mentioned. So I wrote it up here. This is uh, your turn radius is equal to v squared over 11.26 times the tangent of your bank angle. Okay, that's actually a little bit hard to figure out. Um, and the G is variable, so it's not really easy, uh, use, useful. So what we, we can also write that is, uh, you can derive this, is v, it's equal to V squared over uh, G times the square root of the load factor squared minus one. Okay, and uh, so we have three variables in this part of the equation and we can figure it out pretty easily. Uh, change the units, whatever we want to do. <coughs> Yeah, I know it's math, and I, but I never said there wouldn't be math. But this is a pretty simple equation. All we really need is velocity and uh, load factor. That's how much we're pulling, and Earth's gravity, and we can figure it out, okay? And in the F-15E, the corner velocity is 440 knots. Okay, uh, 440 knots, and the max G is 9. 9 G is available. Okay, nine Gs, all right. The F-18, it's got a bit wider corner velocity, uh, 300 to 400, 310 or something like that to 400 knots, but it's only 7.3 G. So let's call that, uh, I'm gonna do numbers at 440, but I'm also gonna do numbers at 380. And do those comparisons with those numbers. Okay, so when you work this out, the uh, turn radius uh, for the F-15E is just about 2,000 feet. And uh, the F-18 at the same speed at 440 knots po uh, post about an 18% turn, turn radius greater uh, because of the lower G available. All right, so if he's, but if he's flying at 380 knots and more inside his window slower, uh, his turn radius is going to be shorter than the F-15E. But right. it turns out that the uh, uh, turn rate is actually uh, more in favor of the F-15E, but just by a small margin, okay? So then it really comes down to the pilot, how they, how they fly it. Okay, so this is turn rate. This is how quickly we go around the turn. And that's a constant times the tangent of the bank angle divided by the velocity. And we can rewrite that as we derived, I didn't derive it for you, but it, this is the way it works, is it's G times the square root of load factor squared minus one divided by the velocity again, and that can give us those numbers. So uh, the, uh, uh, if we're doing the same, same speeds as I mentioned for 40 knots, then the F-15 has a bit, uh, about a 20% better advantage in turn rate and then when uh, you switch to them doing uh, F-18 doing 380 knots versus 440 and doing this G, then the F-15 has a turn rate that's about uh, not quite two degrees better. 
instead of four degrees. Subsequent turn radius is the reason why that Maverick had to have, uh, have the F-18s do an over-G, pull more than they're allowed to get out of that valley, okay? You had to get that nose through that circle and get that nose above that, uh, that ridge line right there so you can be able to exit the valley without hitting the mountain. And so he had to do an over-G to do that. He had to get the higher G available to make that turn radius smaller and turn rate greater, okay? You see how that works? So that's a, it's a limiting factor of the F-18, uh, limited at 7.3 Gs. So remember, our main goal uh, while flying combat is, is not to hit our wingmen. If we did that, we'd be doing the bad guys a favor, right? Because on the good-bad scale, if we take two jets out because we hit each other, that's bad. All right, so we have to fly our airplanes in a way that lets us max perform the jet without hitting the other guy. Okay, that automatically rules out this welded wing flying stuff that we saw in Top Gun Maverick. Categorically, I'm sorry, but that's BS. Fly that way and you're dead, period. All right, we used to have a saying in the Marines, like I said. Uh, I was enlisted, uh, infantry guy for a while. And it was, can I have your stereo? And what that means is, you say that to a guy who's doing something dumb, different, or dangerous, doing something stupid, uh, because he's probably going to get himself killed. And in those days, you know, stereos, real expensive stereos from Japan were cheap in the BX, PX. So you, you always, everybody had Sansui speakers and uh, huge, you know, four channel, two channel, whatever, stereos or quads and, you know, just you name it, all kinds of equipment because it was really, really cheap. And uh, so when somebody was do something stupid, you say, hey, can I have your stereo as you divvy up his stuff and before, you know, you go home in a body bag. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a cautionary uh, statement is what that is, okay? So that's, uh, that, that kind of goes down to, if you want to fly welded wing in combat in a modern jet fighter, can I have your stereo? Flying close together in combat runs counter to longevity. Uh, it looks, uh, but it looks boring on the screen. I'm sorry, but it does. Tactical, but, but tactical is really how it's done. All turns are done at the like tickle, is a contract thing, or buffet onset, that's the like tickle in swept winged airplane. Uh, and it's the, the buffet onset's different in a uh, swept wing airplane than it is for a GA straight wing. Uh, or the contract is light tickle, light, where the buffet onset is, or 5Gs. Okay, those are where our turns are set. Okay, the turn radius at 5G at thir uh, is about 3,500 feet. Okay, in the 30s or 40s, the light tickle equates to even bigger turn radius uh, because, you know, you're not going as fast as you are down low. And uh, the what, that, what you're trying to do is, is to get the airplanes at least one turn radius apart. <clears throat> These are why you have sticks uh, to do some of the talking I'm going to do, about, to, to do right now. So um, now the, uh, uh, you want to have it, like I said, you want to have at least one turn radius apart. So when you turn into the guy, then you're not going to hit him. Because if you're too close, you're going to hit him like that shot in Maverick, you know, where they're flying like this, and he can turn, he turns like that and guns him. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't think so, but it made good, good video. So you want to have guys about one turn radius, at least one turn radius apart. But now you add in uh, visual pickups, okay? You want to make it harder for the bad guys to see you, so generally you're going to fly further apart. Instead of one turn radius, 3,500 feet, you're going to fly wider. And in the F-4, we flew, as I remember, about six to 9,000 feet. And in the uh, F-15E, we flew, uh, we flew nine to 12,000 feet with the stack. We did that in the F-4 too, the stack. But we'd fly further apart. And uh, it's a bigger airplane, and it's easy for you to keep track of the guy. It takes a lot of experience to be able to make that, make your turns uh, and stay in position. Uh, but, you know, the small corrections and gas-eating ones where you're jo jockeying the throttle are fewer. And, but it makes a hard pickup for anybody else to see where you are, where your wingman is. Generally, in the combat AOR, we do not, area of responsibility, we do not fly straight or level with each other. We're going to have a stack, high or low, okay? And that gives the wingman, depending on the outside of the turn, uh, more G available, more energy available, uh, because uh, he can use uh, altitude uh, to help with this turn, okay?
So generally you want, you're, you're going to see tactical at greater than 6,000 feet, which is greater than a mile. So let's look at standard formation. Since I've got graphics uh, and sticks for F-15s, uh, we're going to use that. Uh, every squadron ever flew in had uh, squadron standards that you had to know by heart and you had to fly by. Okay, that made it for easier, for easier for anyone in the squadron to fly and just jump into any formation because everybody's going to do it the same way in the squadron, doing it the same way, same day. Okay, the standard uh, formation is line abreast at nine to twelve thousand feet for Strike Eagles. Uh, preferably with a two, with about a two to three thousand foot stack. Okay, the line of breast is also zero to ten degrees aft. Okay, not thirty degrees aft, not forty five bearing line or anything like that. This is that more of that fighting wing or welded wing kind of a thing. Uh, welded wing is one side, by the way. Uh, so zero to ten degrees. Okay, and what happens is when you're zero to ten degrees, if you're looking like this then if I'm looking at lead like that, he's here. That isn't line of breast. Line of breast is right about here, so I have to look this way. And if your neck hurts, if you look at the guy for a while, you're in position. The other thing about how a squadron standard set out is uh, visual contracts, okay? Because when you're, when you're apart like this, then what you can do is, is you can see through the other guy's six Okay, your responsibility is not outside the formation, it's inside the formation. So this guy's looking right, he's clearing in front over here and aft and down, so he's looking mostly in front and that side, and this guy's form, his responsibility is to clear this side of the formation. So in other words, in Top Gun Maverick, if they'd really been flying tactical, they would have picked Maverick up a long way before he went shoo, right through the formation, okay? That, that whole welded wing thing is crazy, you know, right? So you have to be looking out, and that's how this, the, the lookout goes, is he's clearing, he would have picked somebody out low, all right? You wouldn't be sneaking in. Um, that's the whole purpose, is, is this is, the tactical is more of a defensive uh, formation, but it's also a formation that uses both airplanes, or four if you've got four, as your uh, shooters, okay? It depends on who's engaged. If you're both engaged, you're both engaged, and then you might have split criteria where you're by yourself, okay? But visual lookout is very important. Radar search and, and visual and comm standards are also very important for this as well. Comm standards in particular, I want to talk about that real quick. That is a beef I have with Maverick. Uh, I'll watch the movie again and I'll like it, but uh, that's a beef I have with the reality of, the, of uh, Maverick is, is all that chatter on the radio. People are just talking like this all the time. They're just shooting the shit like they're in the bar, you know, needling each other, sitting on the bar stool. You ain't doing that on the radio. You just ain't. Radios are, not, are a poor way to communicate. You know, it's better when I'm talking to you right now on YouTube and you can hear what my audio says than it is when you're trying to talk on the radio because the, the, the fidelity of the transmission is poor. And our uh, humans, like I'm right doing right now, I have, uh, have a tendency to talk fast, okay? I tend to run the words together and most people do. I talk fast, I got a lot of information, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it out. If you talk fast on the radio, it's hard to understand, okay? That's a real important thing to remember. And whatever flying you do is if you talk fast on the radio, the other guy's not going to hear you. He's not going to understand a lot of it because the radio just doesn't transmit high fidelity uh, radio the audio very well, okay? And that's the other reason why you use standard words to mean things because you got to, to be able to effectively communicate on the radio. And here, if you're the listener, you got to be expecting the words that, you know, a limited, a limited subset of words that you're expecting to hear. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to listen to it and process it and stay with the message. So calm is, there's what we call brevity words, code words that are, are, mean a lot, but everybody already knows what they mean and they have to know that. That's just one of those things you go in there. These guys in the movie, man, they're just chattering like they're sitting there and looking at the guy on, the, on a bar stool next to him. That ain't happening because you think about this. Number one is we're, you know, nine to 12,000 feet apart with a two, two or 3,000 foot stack. You see the other airplane, but you see it as a perspective, like how big it is. 
you measure, well, can I see the twin tails? Or can I distinguish the wings? Uh, or can I see the canopy, you know, as you get closer and closer? And then finally, maybe you can see riding on the airplane and then maybe people in it. But you can't see what those people are doing. Uh, even, even here, when you're in formation and route, you really can't see that uh, other the guy very well. And uh, that's one reason why uh, visual signals, uh, you know, the, the Helen Keller routine has limits, okay? Got to know it, but it has limits. And then you add in uh, pulling Gs and maneuvering, and you're thinking about your energy state, his energy state, where is he going, what the altitude is. You're thinking about 100 different things. You're not chattering. It's not conversation you're having now, okay? There's certain information that feeds into what you're doing, and you need to share that, and you need to be able to hear that. And if somebody's just chattering, shooting a BS, uh, not happening. You know, I got to tell you that uh, that doesn't happen in bad guy land. Uh, and when I was a flight lead, I frowned on anybody doing that kind of chatter stuff, just cruising to or from the AOR, much less in the AOR, because it takes your mind away from the task at hand, what you're doing, what you're going to do next, what you're facing, clearing for the bad guy to sneak up on you, because when you're busy blah, 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 chattering, somebody's sneaking up on you, and they're going to shoot you down. All right, so anyway, that's my rant. Uh, so the real issue now is, is how do you do turns, okay? Well, you can do check turns up to about 20 degrees pretty easy, because then, you know, he can do it, the wingman can do a check turn as well, and he can get out there and stay in position and not use an awful lot of gas, okay? Remember, one of your objectives is to not run into the other guy. Very important. If, and if you force him into using too much extra gas, well, then you're going to run out of gas, run out of on station time, or you get caught up into a fight and you don't have much gas. Getting out and surviving is a hard thing to do. So what you don't want to do is be in the middle of a fight and run out of gas. Good, bad scale? Bad. All right, so turns come in about three different flavors. All right, there's the admin kind of chick turns like I said, up to about 20 degrees. There's 90 degrees, 45 degree turns, and then 180 degree turns, okay? Um, so the contract is that you fly a specific speed and you stay in your position, you know? Whatever it is, nine to 12,000 feet, you know, 3,000 foot stack, et cetera. Uh, and any turn you make is, now I go to mill power and I pull five Gs when you're low altitude. And uh, then it's all a matter of geometry, watching the, the geometry work out and seeing how it happens, okay? So in general, the Air Force guys use come out turns, all right? We're going to use the jet to, tell, to manage the formation and tell, tell you where you're going to go. You can use the radio if you like, but the thing about the radio is that uh, uh, it's, it can be jammed, um, it's chatter, uh, it's distracting, and um, you can also get it triangulated. In other words, they can figure out where you are based on your uh, triangulating your radio call. They know you're there, and uh, now they can have two different uh, radio direction finders and figure out about where you are, and then you're going to get visited by bad guys, okay? Well, if that's what you want, shit hot, go for it. Uh, but <clears throat> and in general, and sometimes you've got to use a radio. In general, the Air Force airplanes fly with a thing that's called half-quick, Okay, which is a frequency hopping radio that you can also go secure with. So not only is it frequent, hop frequencies very quickly, which prevents jamming, uh, because to jam you have to receive the signal, I'm on this frequency, and then you direct uh, higher energy than the radio signal over that, over that area, and you drown out the radio signal that is transmitting. That's jamming. Uh, but if you're hopping, you know, then you get about one word or two words on a frequency, and then you go to the next frequency. There's never enough time on any particular frequency for a jammer to sit on and, and throw out a lot of trons. So uh, that's half quick's a good thing. Being able to go to secure is a good thing because then they can't understand what you're saying. They can't decode it. So that's all a good thing. Uh, but it's still a radio transmission and can be triangulated. Okay, so calm out is generally how you want to proceed until you get engaged. All right. Uh, and that's how we do that. So let's look at a 90 degree flight or a 90 degree turn for a flight. All right, so here we are flying along and uh, this is me and this is you and I want to turn left 90 degrees. So if I'm, gonna, if I'm on the right side, I'm on the outside of the formation where the turn is, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start turning. I'm going to turn into you. 
And then what you're going to do is, is you're going to plow straight ahead until you look down my intakes. Once you see my intakes, then you're going to start turning. And the way the geometry works out is by the time you finish your turn, I've rolled out and yours will then end up in position again, going 90 degrees the opposite direction. Okay. Contract turn, mill power, nine, five, G, five G's or light tickle. And the geometry works out. Uh, you can vary it a little bit, bank angle, etc. cetera, if uh, it's not working out just right through the turn. But that's a 90 degree turn. Now, if again, this is me and this is you, and I wanna turn to the right, well, I can't just start turning in this case because that leaves you out of position. So what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna give a sharp wing rock. And you see that, well, you better be looking at me because your clearing responsibility besides your nose is through the flight. So you gotta be spending a lot of time looking at me, the lead. I give you a wing rock. That means, okay, you start turning. Now for a 90 degree turn, I'm gonna plow straight ahead until I see down your intakes. And then I'm gonna start the turn and work it out. Now we're uh, in position heading 90 degrees to the right. Boom, works great, works great, lasts a long time, okay? So now if we wanna turn less than 90 degrees, how do we do that? We can do a 45 degree turn. Uh, so here we are. Now we're gonna do a 45 degree turn. There's two ways to do this, left and right, of course. So what I'm gonna do is, is uh, I'm gonna turn into you and then I'm gonna turn 45 degree heading and I'm gonna roll out. This puts you ahead of the line. So now what you're gonna do is work the formation, okay? You probably have to pull up if you're level, pull up a little bit and then work out the, the position on the other side and get back into position, 45 degree turn, easy peasy. All right, so now if we wanna do a 45 degree turn to the right and I'm on the inside of the formation as flight lead, what I'll do is I'll give a wing rock. Okay, you start turning thinking, okay, this is a 90 degree turn and I, the flight lead, don't want it to be 90 degrees. When you hit 45 degrees of turn, I'll turn into you. Okay, and when you see that, you roll out. And then I'm gonna work the geometry so we end up in position going at 45 degrees to the right. Boom, boom. Works great, we don't have to talk to anybody, we don't have to say anything. It's all working really smooth. Now we have two versions of a 180 degree turn. Okay, so 180 degree turn. Uh, as always, uh, I got the wing rock thing, and here I am on the right, you're on the left, and I wanna do what's known as a hook turn, 180 degree turn, but we're gonna end up on the same side of the formation, okay? So, I mean, left, left, so left and right. So what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna give the wing rock here, and then when you see that and you start turning, then I'm gonna turn immediately, okay? So now we're both in the turn, and we're gonna end up like that, okay? So I'm still on, the, on this side of the formation and you're still on, the, on this side of the formation, but we're going 180 degrees. That is a, uh, a hook turn, okay? Kind of looks like a hook, all right? So then the other one is a cross turn, okay? This is a little bit more difficult. And the cool thing about the cross turn is that uh, it's a, well, actually I wanna say that the, all of tactical flying really is a direct derivative of the thatch weave. Jimmy Thatch, if you saw my video on uh, the fighter pilot debrief video on Midway, on the Midway battle, uh, Jimmy Thatch used the uh, thatch weave there for the first time. And what he did basically was this cross turn thing, and I'm gonna show you here in a second, and was able to create a situation, a tactical formation maneuver and sticking together that made the Wildcat, the F4F, survivable and even better than the Zero, because the, the Zero was very maneuverable, it had very lightweight armament, it didn't have any self-sealing fuel tanks, so it tended to flame up. The faster it went, the harder it was to turn the airplane, you couldn't roll it very well the faster you went. Uh, so everything has uh, pluses and minuses. And the Wildcat was a tough airplane, and it could stand up to, it had 50 caliber guns, while the Zero had about, uh, 30 out six, uh, 308 actually, I guess, would be more a lot more actual to what the round was. And uh, uh, so anyway, the thatch weave, they were able to, to make the airplane survivable. Instead of just flying and fighting with an airplane, the Wildcat didn't turn as well, didn't climb for shit, sorry, YouTube, but, and uh, it dove really well because it was heavy, 
but that not being able to turn, not being able to climb was a big problem. And by doing the thatch weave, they, uh, they actually made it a very, very uh, survivable airplane, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, still inferior performing. But um, that, uh, that genius uh, invention on the part of Jimmy Thatch actually uh, is the grandfather of all the tactical flying we do today. Okay. And he was a Navy guy. Shit hot. So let's talk about, real quick, about the cross turn. So what I want to do is uh, I want to do a cross turn. And um, there's uh, the, the cross turn is just as it says. It's this way. Uh, and it's a great way to clear six, okay, just like the thatch weave. So what I want to do in a cross turn is, is I'm going to give you a wing rock and start you turning. You start turning, and then I'm going to immediately turn this way. And now we're going to have to deconflict fly pads if we're level. That's another good reason to be at a stack. So boom. Now it's pretty evident really quickly when I give you that ring rock, you start turning, I start turning too, that we're doing a uh, cross turn. Okay. It's not a 90. It's not a 45. Uh, it's not a hook turn. So we're back like this. And what we're, we're going to do is, is we're going to turn around that way and we're going to end up this way, but wide. In this case, we're almost twice as wide as we were before. The geometry works out that way. So in just about every squadron I've ever been in, one of the squadron standards was is that after a cross turn, an automatic shackle. So once you roll out, you just turn into each other 45 degrees, cross, and then bam, like that. And now you're back in position and at the correct spacing. Okay, automatic shackle. There you have it, tactical. You can see why at those distances it'd be really hard to film and uh, not be anything but boring. I mean, just have this little airplane going out here. You can't put two airplanes in a shot. There's no way. So, yeah, he's doing that. And, uh, you know, it's just like, okay, what's he doing? He's just making turns. Let me bitch about one more thing. Okay, so we're both in welded wing. We go up that, that sharp uh, draw, and then we're going to roll over and then pull down. And that's going to be about a 5 or 6G pull down. You're pretty dang close together, you know, if you miss a little bit by just a few seconds. You're going to hit each other, and you've got to be looking. The lead guy, he doesn't have to look at the wing, but the wing guy's got to clear the ground and the lead as well, and you've got a fraction of a second to see drift before you hit him. I don't like that concept. I don't think it works really well. But, hey, um, it looked cool. It did. So, anyway, that's Formation 301, and sorry I had to ramble on a little bit about uh, <laughs> some other aspects of Top Gun, but there it is. I had it in me, and I had to just get it out. <laughs> formation 301, that's what co tactical combat formation looks like and a little on how to fly it, okay? So when you can do that, let's talk. I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters here. Uh, without you guys, Flywire would be a little bit harder to do. And if you'd like to support the channel, I'll leave a link below. If you'd like to subscribe, it looks a bit like this here. And all I can say is thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire.